Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on suicide prevention for LGBTIQA plus people and communities. I'd like to welcome all of the people who have joined us here this evening and also the people who are going to be watching this on recording. MHPM would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respect to the elders past and present for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. I'm Dr Damien Riggs, I'm a professor in psychology at Flinders University and I'm a psychotherapist who works with trans young people. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce our previous slide, sorry. I would like to introduce our panellists for this evening. Uh, the first panellist is Dr Atari Metcalf. Atari, could you explain a little bit about your background coming into general practice? Sure. Thanks, Damien, and welcome, everyone. So I'm a fairly new transplant to general practice, uh, just over a month into my first year as a registrar. Um, so I've just finished my residency and internship. So prior to this was working predominantly in emergency and inpatient psychiatry settings. Um, and prior to that, I spent about 15 years before practicing medicine working in research and policy with a focus on youth mental health and suicide prevention program evaluation. Um, and as part of that, did quite a lot of work with LGBTQ populations. Uh, and I identify as a, as a trans masculine uh, person. That's me. Thanks, Atari. Our next speaker is Emerson Osterberg. Emerson, would you like to tell me a little bit about how you came to be working with LGBTQIA plus young people and their families? Sure. Great to be here tonight. Uh, so I work in private practice and along my journey uh, saw a real need to be able to provide safe spaces for LGBTQIA plus young people and their families. And so um, that was one of the, the spaces that I made sure that we could provide that space and um, provide much needed support. Thanks, Emerson. And our third speaker is Damien Bonson. Damien, could you tell me a little bit about what motivated you to work and research in the area of suicide? Damien, you're muted. Muted. Hi, it had to be one. Hi. Um, I'm just, yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm Damien. I'm an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander gay man. Um, I started working in suicide prevention in the Kimberley around 2011. Um, I pivoted out of a social work double degree into suicidology after witnessing what was happening out in the communities, there was a lot of programs um, that were being rolled out in the communities across the Kimberley, uh, but they didn't seem to be working. So I um, have a postgraduate qualification in suicidology because I wanted to understand what it is that we needed to do. I'm also the founder of Black Rainbow, which is more specifically around the prevention of suicide for the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander LGBTQI uh, community because there is a distinct lack of research uh, resources and evidence in terms of the prevention of suicide for our little community. Thanks, Damien. Next slide, please. So obviously, you know, when we're, we're working in groups, we want to be really mindful that we're being respectful of other people and respectful of us as panellists and, and facilitator. So what's going to happen this evening is we're going to, each of the panellists will give a, a short talk about what their, it looks like in their discipline to be working in this area and then we're going to have Q&A at the end. So we just wanted to start off with just a few definitions uh, because for some people, some of these uh, population groups that we're talking about today may be new to you or may be unfamiliar. So we're not trying to cover everything that people are going to be talking about today, but just to give a little snapshot of some sort of terms that you may not be aware of. So you would hopefully be very aware of the uh, term trans or other people might use transgender. Um, and we want to sort of note that is comparison with cisgender people or cis. So you might hear our speakers talking about that a lot the, this evening. So most people in society would say around 97, 98% of, of people would be cisgender and the, uh, you know, two to three percent of people would be trans. When it comes to sexuality, so a different topic here, shifting from gender modality to sexuality, um, pansexual might be a new um, concept for some people. You may be more familiar with bisexual. Pansexual is a term that used to describe an attraction to people of a diversity of genders or all genders, which is not to say the same is true for bisexual people, uh, but pan's a more recent term to sort of use that more encompassing way of thinking about gender. 
And asexual, again, is another sexual identity that we really want to be very clear, um, is not pathologizing, is not sort of thinking about um, people's some sort of problematic um, lack of interest in other people, but it describes a continuum of interest or desire in sexual activity. It doesn't necessarily mean no interest in intimacy, but it, it, it typically means no interest in sexual activity. So as I've already mentioned, when we're talking about population sizes, we have, you know, some information in Australia, but we have probably more robust information from overseas, and there's no reason to think why that wouldn't translate to Australia. So around 3% of people are likely to be trans or exploring their, their gender or thinking about what their gender means for them. About 1.7% of people are likely to be intersex, and around 3% of people age 18 or over are likely to identify as gay, lesbian, or other, and that can include pansexual, that can include asexual. Um, just a few little numbers here that Atari put together for us from the private life study. Um, just to think about suicidal ideation, what it looks like in these populations that we're talking about today. So these very high numbers, over three quarters of, oh no, just under, sorry, three quarters of population um, report lifetime suicidal ideation, and you know, a little under half in the last 12 months. And if we look at this nice little sort of flowchart that Atari did, it's, this is most likely to be the case for trans men, followed by non-binary people, trans people, cis women and cis men, when we're talking about gender. When we're talking about sexuality, it's most likely to be the case for pansexual people, followed by queer, asexual, other, bi, lesbian and gay. So there's lots of different stats we could have thrown at you, but we just wanted to highlight these really high rates of suicidality, including in the last 12 months for LGBTQIA plus people and to look at some of those points of difference, who's more likely this is to be true for. And we also wanted to really note that we're working here today and we would encourage everyone else to work with the language of died by suicide. We know that there's other terms that gets used in the media that's sort of quite blaming of people who have died by suicide. So we want to really f draw your attention to that language. Next slide, please. So as you will have already seen, these are the learning outcomes and we're going to be looking at these through each clinician's own experiences, but also talking in, for some people around the case study that we've sent through to you that focuses on Kara, a trans woman, and her own journey through self-harm and, and what that means in her relationships with other people, including her mental health professional. So I think that's enough from me. I think we'll start with the presentation so that we can get going and leave lots of time for questions. Atari, next slide, please. Thank you, Damien. So as Damien explained, um, it's, it's a very big topic, so I, I'm obviously just going to focus more on the general practice setting. Um, and I'm going to focus quite a lot on our case study and try and draw that into, uh, into my presentation. But there's certainly space in the Q&A to explore this more uh, afterwards. Um, so thinking about how we might come to in engage with a, a person who's trans, gender diverse or uh, LGB um, in general practice, well they might come to you for one of broadly three different things in terms of where it becomes really relevant to think about gender and sexuality. So they might be exploring their sexual identity or their, their gender identity. It might be at different stages as they progress towards exploring coming out to others in their lives. They might be coming to you as a doctor to initiate uh, gender affirmation through hormones or surgery or other pathways. Um, and really importantly, they might just be coming to you for broader mental health support or, or medical support. It's really important to remember, as I often recall the trans broken arm analogy, which is that um, just because somebody's presented to you with a, a broken arm and they happen to be trans, you don't have to always focus entirely on their se sexuality or gender, but it absolutely is very relevant. And I think it's really important to know, acknowledge that many trans uh, people have had a really uh, often quite scary experiences of accessing healthcare and quite uh, negative experiences as, as others will expand on later in the presentation. Um, and so it, it is absolutely relevant to be mindful and, and conscientious. Um, and I guess when it comes to suicide specifically, if you've got you know, a patient in front of you, they may be in acute crisis or it might come up through these conversations. Um, for CARA, there's a number of things that kind of stood out in the, in the case study as sort of proximal stresses that might have precipitated her presenting for an acute, you know, more of an acute crisis. So it's mentioned at the, at the end of the case study that she's been thinking about self-harm and worried that it might be escalating and, and transforming into perhaps suicidal ideation, although it's not clearly stated and that's obviously something you'd need to explore but and there's a few reasons for that perhaps and I uh, highlighted that I needed to 
to be ex expanded on. So one is the recent relationship breakdown, um, and there's some suggestion of possibly some some domestic violence in that setting. Uh, she's socially isolated and feeling quite lonely, and in the in the distant past, she experienced a pretty significant parental rejection, has a past experience of anxiety, um, and has has had a really negative experience of exploring um, her gender with a, with a psychologist. So there's so a lot to unpack there. Um, and it's really important as, as medical practitioners and as mental health practitioners not to fall into the trap of inadvertently pathologising someone's gender or sexuality when you're engaging them early on, because that's something that many of us would be very sensitive to. Next slide. Thank you. So um, hopefully before Cara steps into your practice, um, you've already had a look at your, at your practice and considered what is safe or unsafe about this um, and I think you know looking at the people and the, the, the physical environment um, and your systems is really important um, so have an audit of your organization there's some fantastic resources we'll share at the end with sort of checklists that you can literally use to kind of assess your, your space um, but this means you know making sure your staff are competent including the trauma-informed kind of uh, approach to care um, signposting with literally signs or, or pronoun badges um, and then looking at your intake systems making sure you don't make assumptions about gender, um, space for changing legal names and, and preferred names, those sorts of things. Next slide. And once you have someone like Kara in front of you, it's really important as, as would be the case in all mental health uh, practice to try and make sure you've got a nice, quiet, uh, confidential space where you're not going to be interrupted so you can really sit down and explore things further. Um, first up with all, um, all people, not just trans people, I think we really need to normalise the practice of just clarifying pronouns. So I use he or they, and as many of, of in the introductions um, stated, that, that initially um, signposts to a trans person that you're thinking about gender and you're, you're inclusive. Um, but it's also worth clarifying, are there any people that you use different pronouns with, or is there a different name you use in certain circumstances, especially if they're not necessarily out to everyone or in different domains of their lives? Um, I'm not going to go through the entire medical history because that's something that you'd be familiar with already, but I'll just draw attention to a few important things for trans and gender diverse people. And in particular, when you're exploring the social connections, understanding if they have a connection to the uh, LGBTQ community, and that includes online supports as well, which can play a big role um, for, for these communities in, in supporting them. Um, and then in terms of their past mental health history, exploring again gently what their experience has been like. Um, we know with Cara there's a number of things in her in her history that are quite uh, protective. So she's got a, a job in aged care which she loves, um, but there's also some, some tensions around family and I think it's important to explore if she has any chosen family, which is a concept that will be expanded on further in the presentation, but recognising that many trans and uh, LGB people have lost connections with their traditional families. Um, and when you're exploring uh, that, that past medical history or exploring self-harm behaviours, recognising too that language around bodies is really important. So, so be guided by what the person in front of you uses. Um, so recognising, especially for trans people, that they might direct self-harm towards particular anatomy that they're, they're perhaps experiencing discordance with. Um, so for trans masculine people, that might be using words like chest instead of breasts, um, but really be guided by the, the patient th themselves. Uh, next slide. Uh, and similarly for medical history, um, there are I guess a few ex exceptional things to note. Um, so trans and gender diverse people may be taking hormones. Not all people will medically um, undergo affirmation uh, therapies, but but making sure you've got that documented really well. And I think especially for GPs, um, it's important to maintain that up to date list of, of you know medications for all your patients. But recognising that hormone therapy is something that other practitioners may be less familiar with, and so when making referrals, it's really important to to have all of that down. And antiretroviral therapies in terms of things like pre-exposure, post-exposure, and treatment for HIV um, might be important to to note. Um, as I said before, don't assume when exploring the developmental history that all suicidality or mental health difficulties arise from discordance with gender or sexuality um, and make sure you do a thorough, broader um, history about, uh, about their background. Um, but do still consider gently exploring it with them and, and particularly how comfortable people are with themselves how they cope with transphobia and, and homophobia um, because, you know, it's really quite common as we'll hear in further uh, presentations just how almost universal it is. So how is it that people bounce back from that? What are the kinds of strategies they use to keep, you know, keep themselves feeling, feeling good and affirmed? Uh, next slide. <clears throat> 
So as I said before, there are a number of different acute stresses that can um, commonly present for, for patients who are suicidal in my experience and um, and these are not necessarily that specific to LGBT people but um, I do want to draw attention to the fact that insecure housing and, uh, and employment and food security are major problems particularly for trans people. Um, this isn't necessarily the case, we don't know with CARA in this case study if, the, if this is going on but you definitely need to explore it. Um, there's extreme levels of discrimination in the workplace for trans populations and often that obviously create cycles of difficulty in terms of accessing secure housing as well. Um, exploring identity documentation difficulties is also something that's been recognised in a number of studies that can precipitate suicidal uh, crises in this population because that sets off another large chain of events and having to out themselves every time they are in the process of accessing um, any kind of government service or applying for a job. Um, and of course drug and alcohol use is, is quite uh, prevalent in the LGBT community. It's not all necessarily pro problematic use, but you do need to take a thorough history and understand, you know, if, if this is if this is the contributing factor. And we don't know actually with CARA, that's not something we've explored yet in the, in the case study. Next slide. So once you've, you've explored all of that and you've made your sort of risk assessment um, with the person in front of you um, and you've explored the suicidal crisis, if that's the case, which I'm sort of focusing on really, um, given, given the case study, you're obviously going to make your risk assessment and engage in some form of safety planning. There's some really great sort of generic tools out there, but I would highlight that there is um, some fantastic resources through ACON's Trans Vitality eLearning, which is a four-part module. Um, it's available through the link there and will be circulated later. Um, into, and that's specifically around suicide prevention and intervention skills for the trans community, if you want to kind of use this as a springing stone. Um, there's, I guess, importantly for, for trans folk, if you're thinking, you know what, this person's really at imminent risk and you collaborate with them around a plan to escalate to more acute care services such as emergency department or psychiatric support, um, I'd really strongly encourage you to, to call ahead and have a chat to the admitting officer and, um, and make sure that you flag with them any you know, difficulties or, or foreseen difficulties that this person might encounter, particularly in relation to um, pronouns, names, legal you know, discrepancies between legal name, Medicare name, those sorts of things, just to create a smoother environment and not to reinforce that kind of trauma. Um, similarly, in terms of access to hormones, it can be a real challenge in the inpatient setting and I think it's important as GPs to advocate um, as best you can with, with that kind of um, heads up. Similarly, if it's you know maybe less acute support needed and you're looking at ongoing support as well, there's a very large multidisciplinary team um, that you can kind of construct to support your, your client or patient and on the right hand side of the screen you can see just a, it's not an exhaustive list but the kinds of people who are often involved in caring for uh, trans and gender diverse people more broadly um, and there are a number of specific services that are highlighted there which the links will be circulated in a resource I, I believe available later um, but that you know spans from other medical practitioners whether that's around hormones and endocrinologists or um, through to peer support services which play a, a really uh, found foundational role particularly for social support and mobilization for this community and there are a number of structured programs where you can link people to peers through ACON and other services in New South Wales Agenda Centre 2010. Um, there's specific suicide prevention and mental health support lines like QLife um, and there are other supports as well in, in terms of advocacy. So the Inner Sydney Legal Service um, provide a lot of support here in Sydney for trans people, particularly around documentation and the legal challenges inherent. Um, so it's good to familiarise yourself in your local community with what's available and, and the resources that we'll, we'll share um, is, a, is a great source for that. So I might leave it there and um, we can explore more in the, in the Q&A and I'll, I'll hand it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Ajari. That was wonderful. Someone has just asked a quick question if the slides will be available at the end. They're actually available to you now on the link on the right-hand side of the video that you're watching us on. There's a link there to download a PDF of the slides. Emerson, would you like to share with us your perspective as a clinical psychologist, please? Great. Thank you so much. So look, today we're going to really be focusing on the fact that Cara is transgender um, and the fact that when we look at the most important factor that you need to do differently when working with uh, people who identify as transgender um, is the fact that you need to provide gender-affirming care. 
that is a lot of the other the, the other ways to reduce suicidal ideation and overall mental health outcomes are very similar to uh, other clients who work through through your um, walk through your doors but gender affirming care is is the most important factor and I'm going to be really focusing on that today um, next slide please Uh, so just a really quick point that I wanted to make is that on nearly every com uh, continent in all of recorded history, we have seen that there's been more than two genders. So this is not a new concept and, and there is a lot of rhetoric at the moment about that. Well, there is a, a lot more trans people and that comes down to a greater amount of visibility and the fact that our society is thankfully becoming safer for people to be trans. So um, that is the reason why we're seeing higher numbers, uh, not for any other reason. Next slide please. So why is gender affirming care just so important and why is it considered best practice? So when we talk about gender affirming care, we can see that as, as Cara's experience, she experienced a really negative response uh, to being trans uh, by a previous clinician. And 42.1% of people who've reached out to practitioners don't understand or have not respected um, people who are trans or gender diverse. 65.8% uh, of people have experienced a lack of community or family support. So we can see that when, if, if you can't go somewhere that, that says, yes, we're going to be gender affirming, then, then no one's going to talk about their suicide with you. Um, you have to create safety first. Next slide, please. So we can see that 60% um, of young people don't even know that there's health professionals that specifically work in the area of gender identity. Um, we also know that um, one in five transgender, period, transgender people have experienced direct discrimination from mental health practitioners because of their gender status each week. So again, if we've got this large number of people constantly experiencing a lack of affirming care, then that is going to increase the likelihood of suicidal ideation um, and intent and create unsafe spaces within a space that is actually meant to be protecting them and supporting them. And this is why gender affirming care is just vital for this population. Next slide, please. So what does gender affirming care look like? So when we're providing gender affirming care, one of the things that we want to look at is that we place the person as the expert to their gender. So we don't see ourselves as trying to determine or pathologize their gender. What we are saying is if you come in and you tell me that you're a female, then you're a female. That, that is what gender affirming care is. Um, we don't then try and work out how they got here or if there's enough evidence to say that this is where they're at. They tell us that that's where they're at and we, we use the pronouns that they would like to be um, referred by. We use their chosen name. Uh, we use affirming language that makes them feel like they're seen and heard uh, just as you would anyone else. Uh, we ask the person for information about words that might be triggering. Uh, as Atari said, there, there might be maybe parts of a person's body that they don't like to use certain names. So we clarify, we, we talk to them about things that, that might be distressing and then we work to be able to fit in with what they need, not what we need to feel comfortable with in our session. We support the person's choice in social affirmation and we also support the person's choice in medical affirmation. Um, and, and sometimes that can mean, for, particularly for our young people, that uh, they go on puberty blockers for adolescents, uh, feminizing or masculinizing hormones or surgery for older clients. And, and again, not all trans people will use any sort of medical intervention. Um, and, and I think the other big thing is that, that everyone's journey is different. So you have to meet the person where they're at to be able to support them through that journey. Next slide, please.
We can see that when people are supported with the psychological services to affirm their gender um, and the medical intervention to affirm their gender, if that's what they choose to do, then we know from this study as well as a couple of other studies that have recently been published uh, that their mental health outcomes are comparable to their peers. Now, when you're looking at a comparison to those who do not receive the intervention or gender-affirming care, they're 13 times more likely to have suicidal ideations. We can take that away by allowing them to be who they are. Why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we provide services that allow these young people and these older people to, to be their authentic self? Um, next slide, please. And the biggest, I guess one of the biggest messages I, I want to drill home is, is that it can be really overwhelming when, when you start working in, in this population. And I think as professionals, we can be very well-meaning, but we can, we can not know where we're at. And one of the things that I would say is you've shown up today, and so you know more information, hopefully, after this presentation than you knew at the beginning. Um, and so your journey of understanding uh, gender-affirming care hopefully has increased. Uh, but it, it's, it's an idea that you start at a particular phase and you grow in your development. And being able to work out where you're at and the knowledge that you don't have and you still need uh, is super important. This isn't an area you can just wing it. It is an area that you do need to understand the terminology. You do need to be able to practice using different pronouns. You do need to know how to correct yourself when you make a mistake. Uh, and if you can do that, then you are actually going to provide such affirming care and reduce that person's suicidality just by showing up for them in that way. Next slide, please. I think that might be the last one. Well, I've got one more. Um, <laughs> um, the other important point, just to point out the end, is, is that, that often one of the things that gets reflected to me is, is that while, while I work with a lot of young people who, who do have their family of origin, I work with a lot of people who are out of, out of that teenage years who, who have a family of choice. And a lot of the times our systems don't allow for that family of choice. So when they go to the hospital, it's next of kin. Um, it's not their best friend who, because they don't have any family of origin, should be the person who's called. Uh, we have to know that, that this is a very... Um, assessing a, a person's family of choice is just as important as assessing their family of origin and is more likely to protect them in their safety planning um, to be able to provide that support because their family of origin can often be the ones who have perpetrated a lot of the trauma. Um, so making sure that we address that in, in our planning is super important. So thank you for, for listening and I'll pass over to, to Damien, our next speaker. Thanks, Emerson, for that wonderful, comprehensive introduction to gender-affirming care. And I'd love to just add in that we should also always think about animals as families of choice. We know from the really growing body of research at the moment that animals are such an important buffer against stresses, including being buffers against self-harm. So now I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Damien Bonson, to talk about his perspective on suicidality in Indigenous communities from his perspective as a suicidologist. Uh, good evening and thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Um, just quickly, um, I did a bit more background about me. I'm currently the only Aboriginal uh, LGBTQTI plus uh, person with a postgraduate qualification in suicidology. Um, I'm not a clinician, um, so I'm not speaking from the position of a clinician. Um, in the work that I've done over the years, something that I, has become quite apparent to me that's not necessarily discussed is that suicide is actually quite a low frequency event. Um, and that I find that sometimes that, that gets missed in the discussion. So there is this um, catastrophization of suicide. And what I find, particularly when I've been working in the indigenous suicide prevention space is that it becomes highly emotive um, because of the the very real impact of these of the lives that we look that are lost to suicide, but the catastrophization of um, suicide can, it, from my perspective, can actually impede effective intervention. 
Um, we do need to, unfortunately, be a bit dry in the conversations um, and we need to look at the data and that includes, you know, uh, qualitative data as well. Uh, one of the key things that I say to people when I have really just a short period of time and work with Indigenous people is um, just don't be racist. Um, that's a really good starting point um, in terms of um, your interaction. Um, suicide is a behaviour and it's not a mental illness. Um, that's something that became apparent to me throughout my studies as well. Um, and there's the, the, I find that the conflation of mental illness um, with suicide is, is also obstructive to, you know, alternative prevention efforts that are out there. Um, we're definitely seeing a shift um, more globally. I don't see, I have recognised it really here in Australia, um, but there is a shift out of the mental health space and actually into a suicidology and understanding suicide as a human behaviour rather than a mental illness to come up with these preventative efforts. Um, suicide prevention is really about what we think will work. Um, there's absolutely no guarantee that the interventions that are put into place will actually work. Next slide, please. Um, just to, um, there's a few areas of I guess, um, risk factors, um, particularly in, in the context of CARA's life. There are, and these are just really ge general and it's not exhaustive. Um, there are universal risk factors which every, um, every person um, can be exposed to. Um, there are LGBTQTI specific ones and also there are Indigenous specific ones. Um, but risk, risk factors interact with people differently or people interact with risk factors very differently. Um, and but also being exposed to a risk factor or risk factors does not equate someone to um, suicidality or suicide ideation. However, there is a higher likelihood that their quality of life um, isn't optimal. And it really is to ask them what's going on and affecting them. Uh, for someone like Cara, who is, um, you know, Indigenous and trans, all of these risk factors could be, hap um, uh, could be happening for them or only um, parts of. So it is really important to ask. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to reiterate um, the importance of gender affirming healthcare. Uh, currently, we don't have any uh, anything really substantive around what that looks like for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander transgender people. Um, there's, there's quite a paucity of, of research or evidence based in Indigenous queer suicide in general, but um, what I do know, um, and from the conversations that I've been having with quite a number of Indigenous trans people, but also from the research that gender affirming care is really important. Uh, plus there's some additional stuff there that I've um, added into, this, into the slide. Also wanted to reiterate um, what Atari had said earlier, um, that the use of inclusive language and inclusive environments will definitely go a long way in terms of your intervention and working with, with a client. Um, one of the things I also say to people is that if you do have an Indigenous client, do not automatically assume that culture uh, is going to be what they require. Um, I, I personally don't buy into the mantra that culture will pre prevent suicide. Um, it hasn't, for me, been really unpacked as to how, um, particularly in regional and remote areas where if we define culture as living on, living on country, speaking language, you know, in, um, engaging in, you know, custodial practices and law, there's a lot of that going on, but that's where we're seeing the higher rates of Indigenous suicides in those areas. So I'm not really sold on the idea that culture um, will prevent suicide in that context, maybe in the city where there isn't as much of that and that's what they need. But again, ask the individual and find out what they need. Next slide, please. In 2015, um, there was a first ever uh, National Indigenous LGBTQI Roundtable um, that I helped facilitate and get off the ground um, as part of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention Evaluation Project. And here's a few of the themes that have emerged out of that uh, roundtable. Um, unfortunately, um, there hasn't been any um, further work done on this space. Um, this is despite the, um, the unknown quantum of millions upon millions of dollars that is in suicide prevention. Um, none of it has been directed, um, not in a way that is commensurate with need in terms of um, preventing suicide for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, LGBTQI community. Uh, next slide, please. In 2000, also in 2014, 2015, um, I started some insider research um, because there was no literature. There was um, in terms of that, the, that more specifically looked at Indigenous LGBTQI suicide prevention or suicidality. So I crowdfunded about $25,000 
and produced this report um, called Voices from the Black Rainbow. Uh, it was the first report that's ever been done in suicide prevention, particularly around the Indigenous, um, Indigenous queer community, and has gone on to um, be, be ba big background, a background paper for quite a number of um, Commonwealth um, policies. Um, however, it doesn't. It's, apparently, it's not academic enough to be um, picked up um, by um, queer researchers who are kind of sneaking into the Indigenous queer suicide prevention space. But um, it had, definitely has a footprint, and it was a first. Next slide, please. Uh, the work that I've uh, done over the years has led to three current three projects, research projects and then the three first Indigenous uh, queer suicide prevention projects in the country. This one's from WA, um, called Breaking the Silence. Uh, this was um, based on a workshop that I delivered called Inclusive Practices, which is around uh, creating inclusive environments um, for suicide prevention, mental health, uh, other social services to ensure that um, their services are inclusive and so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer folk can access them. Um, next slide, please. And in terms of Cara, um, I recommend that you draw on Cara's own strengths, um, her connections, um, in, engage Cara in the process, and also some linkages, including Black Rainbow, and also Indigenous and non-Indigenous services. Next link, please. Um, as if Black Rainbow will be releasing our report in the next month or so with some of the first national data that speaks to mental health and suicidality, plus some other baseline data around uh, some of the social um, aspects that are going on for us as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarian, for that wonderfully comprehensive overview. Uh, we've now finished our three presentations, so now it's time for the Q&A. So we've had a few questions pop up, but we, we and we'll start addressing some of those, but I would love you to send in some more using the question bo button at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So a first question that we've got that I'm going to direct to Atari is someone from New South Wales has asked about um, in, in their understanding that we're not currently permitted to make name changes to medical records with that Medicare proof. How can we go about that? What can we do to make that different? Uh, yeah, look, I'd, I'd double check that based on the institution or the environment you're working within. So I know that many hospitals can still um, provide an alternative name that's on, on people's, you know, hospital ID tags um, and ensures that certainly in waiting rooms and that kind of thing that they're addressed by their name in the absence of Medicare proof or even a legal name change. And it can still at the back end be linked to the, the legal name. Um, at least that's been my experience. Maybe um, it's, it's more specific because I, I worked at St Vincent's, which is its own sort of system. It's a slightly different system to the wider New South Wales Health. But speaking to colleagues, I'm aware that this is also possible in, in hospitals like RPA. Um, when it comes to general practice, um, depending on the system you have, I know with uh, best practice, there is certainly um, in the latest updates an option to um, identify people's names as well as uh, pronouns. There's like boxes where you can tick those things and, and address those um, and then that retrospectively applies the, the name. So it doesn't necessarily require Medicare change. Um, if you are going to go down that road, um, often in terms of Medicare change, it does usually require a legal uh, change of name certificate. Um, and and if it comes down to gender, uh, you can also change that simply with a letter from a general practitioner um, and they can change that so that all Medicare um, uh, purposes, you can you can have the, the correct gender uh, for, your, for your patient, uh, which is really important, especially for things like accessing uh, PBS subsidised medications and interventions. Thanks, Atari. We've had a question come in for Damien, which is based on all the things you talked about and the lack of you know, attention and giving to Indigenous LGBTIQ people and suicide, and, and that includes the lack of attention sometimes to the work of Black Rainbow, what would you suggest can be done to advance Indigenous LGBTQIA plus suicide prevention? I support Black Rainbow in the work that we do. Uh, we are 100% volunteer run, all unwaged. Uh, we don't receive any funding. We um, get by on donations, which we're kind of happy with. So it allows us to focus on our own objectives and not others. Um, but yeah, get behind us, blackrainbow.org.au. Um, we've got quite a bit of research that we're ramping up later this year and into the future. Thanks, Damien. That's wonderful advice to everyone that everyone should follow. And if you go to the Black Rainbow website, you can certainly don't, can donate to the wonderful work that they do. So I would encourage everyone who's looking to make a donation to a great organisation to do that. Uh, we've had another question come in, and this one I'm going to chuck your way, Emerson. Um, someone's asked, for those of us who work in a psychological diagnostic space, 
How can we respectfully work with clients who may require a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to access gender affirming healthcare? Whilst it's not okay to pathologise trans people, how can we approach the subject of a diagnosis that may not be experienced as affirming for the client, but could help them in their transition journey? Thanks, Amy. A really great question because this, this can be a really tricky one. And I think the thing is most people, well, we have access to the internet, right? So people know the state of the system to be able to get the care that they need. So they're not going to be surprised that they have to jump through hoops to be able to get the medical um, medical intervention that they're seeking um, to affirm their gender. I think one of the things that, that you could do is uh, whenever I have anyone come into to my office or, or to, to my practice, I always say I'm, I'm not here to, I'm not here to be the gatekeeper, I'm not here to um, tell you what to do, I'm here to listen and be part of your journey and to be able to support you. And there may be some things or some hoops that we have to jump through because the world hasn't caught up yet. Um, but we're going to provide support around getting you through those things. So you end up being someone who is there to be able to support the person through those really tricky situations that are sometimes really pretty horrible. Um, and to have to continually tell people and convince people of your gender um, is something that cis people don't have to do. Uh, and, and I think we need to be able to just put it on the table that, that you acknowledge that that's what has to happen to be able to get them the care, but they don't actually, um, you know, you're playing your part in the system. Thanks, Everson. We've got a great follow-up question for Damien. And that question is, um, you spoke about suicide as a behaviour and non mental health issue. Could you break that down a little more, please? In, in the real simplest terms is that you don't need to have a mental illness to be suicidal. Um, there, there's a lot more that probably can be said than in, the, I don't think we have the time for that. But yeah, real simplest terms is that you don't need to um, have a mental illness to uh, be suicidal or have suicide ideation. Thanks, Jamie. I mean, that's really good and really clear uh, point to make. Um, Another question has come through that I might direct to Emerson, who works with young people. Um, what ex well, I guess it's, the question is, what experience do you have working with non-binary preteens? But I think the question is more around what resources do you direct people towards to support um, non-binary young people? Yeah, look, I, I think yeah, as, as a non-binary person myself, um, I think it, it's really clearly un uh, it's well. We're, we're directing. I think there's a few things. If, if they're within a family structure, I always say a little bit like the the journey of the um, of the clinician and the fact that we're at different phases. A lot of our non-binary young people, um, when when they tell their parents that they're non-binary, uh, that can really confuse some parents because they haven't grown up with this language. So we need to get them access to language and a common and get them on the same level. And so I always, um, there's the, I've got a similar slide, that, that a similar picture um, that, that has a transition of, of, of a family. And, and I think one of the important things to know is that when we break it down and tell the young person that they're here and their parents are here or other parts of their their um, family are in different spots but we want to get them all up to speed and how we do that well part of that journey is is as the clinician your job is to educate <laughs> and to inform and to provide the support and to lead them to organizations like trans hub um and to uh 2010 and to minus 18 uh and to transcend there are brilliant organizations out there doing such fabulous work in this space and the more information and knowledge they have um, to normalize what they're seeing the better it's going to be. Thanks Everson. There's a related question that's come through that I might put back to you again but I'll put in my own two cents worth. So the question is around how do we work with young trans people uh, who are having suicidal ideation when their parents are refusing to be accepting including when they're continuing to use an old name 
And this person's raised the really important point that child protective services often don't see this as a protection concern, which is something I've been speaking about for quite a number of years now that we need to, everyone here in this space this evening and everyone beyond that to be working towards raising this in, in the context of child protection, that these are actually child protection issues. But I'll pass that over to Emerson now to add some extra words into that. Look, I think the first thing that I try and do is see whether the parents are coming from. I, I think, I would say the majority of the parents that I have come through my door all have very similar fears. They, they fear that we live in a society where their kids are going to get hurt and they want the best for their kids and they're absolutely petrified something's going to happen to them. And so if, if they that they don't want this to be true not because they don't want to necessarily um, support their child, they, they want their child to have an easier life and and this signs them up for a harder life. Well, what I would say is that <laughs> not affirming your gender and not affirming the, the identity that you have as a person who transitioned very late, well, what I would consider late in life compared to the young kids that I see who get to live this spectacular life as, as young people and know no difference, um, is, is that it's a really hard road and, and it is a much better space to be living your authentic life. Um, so I always try and get parents on board and, and if I don't get them on board, more times than not I do get them on board um, and it's slow steps and it's not vilifying the parents either. It's, it's not saying you just need to step up and change. It's, it's being able to s s be with them and break down what's going on for them because if you can do that with the parents, they're going to get on board. If you can find out what's preventing them, they're going to get on board more times than not. Um, and then I think if, if you can't get them on board and the few ones, they, then you start to build up support networks without the parents involved. So this is where you look at family of choice, you look at friends, you look at support networks, you look at community, you look at organisations like 2010 who have uh, groups, the Gender Centre in Sydney has a trans group, um, Transcend has support. So there, there's lots of services that you can build support networks where this, these people can get a different family to be able to support them through that. Thanks, Emerson. We've had a few questions come together that I'm going to sort of bunch together here and there about questions about uh, uh, about supporting non-binary young people and particularly in schools, which is great that we've got some educators here with us this evening. Um, I've shared with our MHPN uh, organiser a link that she will share with everyone uh, or the attendees this evening that is a module that provides ways to educate schools around how to facilitate non-binary inclusion, how to educate staff, how to educate families. So that's a great sort of resource to start with in terms of how do we introduce this language? How do we help people, as Emerson said, to understand something that may be really new to them? We've also had a Follow-up question for Damien that's quite a little bit similar to the previous one, but hopefully means he can expand a bit more on that. And the question is, if I can find it, is around how can we address the lack of culturally competent, safe referral pathways for LGBTIQ people? It really depends where you are to what's available. Um, and in terms of addressing it is really looking at um you know using a combination of you know being both queer friendly and indigenous and aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friendly and that's why at the beginning for me the, the the main thing is just don't be racist um and also don't be afraid to actually engage um, with the aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community sometimes that um the fear of making a mistake can also um, become problematic in terms of you know uh, wanting to be at, needing to be able to respond to why people are there. I'll refer back to um, the trans broken arm thing. Someone is coming in as an Indigenous person, but they're also just a person. Um, so yeah, the, the number one thing is to ultimately just don't be racist. Um, and But also be inquisitive in terms of that person's life as well. And so you have a greater understanding of what their story is and where they've come from to get, get through your front door and get to you. Because if they've made that step and they've come to you, they've come to you because they've, they've, you, they've identified yourself, or at least somebody has as being someone that is there to assist them, so it's around ensuring um, that that space is, um, is, is safe for them. Thanks, Damien. 
Um, someone's asked a question, which I think, you know, it's a challenging question, but it's a useful question that maybe Atari might like to speak to, which is, can you help me understand why it is important to signal our pronouns? As initi initially, as a counsellor, I minimise what I share about myself with my clients to keep the focus on the client. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, look, I think the intention between the, behind that suggestion from, from where I was starting from is to say that uh, it's about just normalising pronouns. I think it's still a foreign concept for a lot of people and it's seen as um, as, as controversial, it's often thrown around in the media um, as, as being an issue, like it's going to somehow generate a whole new generation of trans people or it's somehow going to make it contagious, which it doesn't. We all have pronouns, every single one of us, and we use them all the time. Um, and I think just it, it's really to, to step back and say, I actually can't tell if you're trans or not because trans is a massive spectrum. Um, and by, by asking and by stating our own, um, it, it enables a dialogue around it. Um, I don't think it, it's it's really just about making something feel like a normal thing to do and to get comfortable with it. Um, I relate to the point about not wanting to necessarily share all the time about yourself, and and I um, as a as a trans identified practitioner um, haven't always disclosed my my trans status to to people I work with either. And there's no way they can know I'm trans. But but having that uh, having a badge and and saying that very immediately. Um, sets up a dynamic where it doesn't have to fall back to them to feel safe to, to disclose. It just sort of makes it a safe space, I think. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Atari. Um, this is can a... I just add to that just for a second? Sure, Emerson. Go for it. Um, I think the other thing to note on the pronouns is, is that uh, particularly um, the pronouns can change. And so if, if a client comes in and their pronouns are they, them, or their pronouns are he, him, or their pronouns are they, him, or, or she, her, it's just important to note that, that you, you may have those pronouns, you may have practiced for five weeks to get those pronouns right, and they may come in and, and want to alter them slightly, and, and you've got to relearn. Um, and, and normalizing that and knowing that, that gender is a journey and is, is super, super important. Sorry. Thanks, Emerson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a question here that, you know, I think I would direct people to the resources that are going to be available at the end of the webinar. And the question was, is there anywhere that lists gender affirming safe GPs or medical professionals? So I think Atari has given us some examples of that, but he might want to elaborate that. Certainly here in South Australia, we have the website transhealthsa.com that's run by trans people that lists people who have been vetted as being trans affirming. Yeah, so in, in New South Wales, uh, transhub.org.au has a list of gender affirming GPs um, and also OSPATH, which is the Australian Professional Association for, for Trans uh, Healthcare. They also maintain lists of not just G GPs, but other allied health and other medical practitioners as well. Um, and that's a national database. I believe there are similar things in Victoria and Western Australia as well, but those are, those are probably the, the two that I'm most aware of. Thanks, Victoria. There's a really applied a question here that I think I'll put out to whoever wants to ask it, because I think the question itself is an interesting formulation. So the person has shared that they work with a client who has a range of different psychosocial disabilities, and I won't name what they are, uh, and that they're non-binary. And that this person is often, often states that they feel like people aren't helping them or that life would be better off without them, other people's life would be better off without them. Um, so how do we help that person engage in self-care, engage in domestic car tasks, engage in connecting with community? I, I think the first thing is, is finding out their interests. Um, mm. Because I, I think we have a lot of community, uh, like for instance in, in Sydney, um, there, there's, there's a lot of, well, not a lot, but there, there's a few spaces that, that they can go just to engage with other people. Um, and I can guarantee that, that a lot of, I mean, we know the stats on trans people and mental health, um, that there's people having similar experiences. And, and so if we can know their interests and know what they like, then it's starting to look for, for activities that are within community and can help them to connect with other people having similar experiences. And then they can broaden out. Thanks, Emerson. Oh, you go, Atari. Go. I was just going to say, there are some formal peer support services too in most states and territories, so um, depending on their age and stage. But certainly um, 
here in Sydney, again, Trans Hub through ACON oper operates some peer support services. Um, there's also groups through 2010, as Emerson mentioned before, where they can link face-to-face -face or online. Um, Trans Pride Australia is a is a community-driven organisation, which is an informal source of social support, and they organise meetups online and offline. Uh, and West Australia, there's Freedom Centre. Um, there's a whole range of different organisations. And even WA. Transport WA uh, and in uh, certain health services too, if you're in an acute setting, certainly I know back at St Vincent's we had uh, peers, sort of navigators, we're really lucky to have them and, and included in that there were some trans identified people. So kind of scout around the community and find some, find some um, local ones and see if you can create a bit of a, a resources for yourselves. Thanks for Jerry and Emerson. We've got a question for Damien, which is what are your thoughts on the SEWB wheel as a tool for First Nations queer suicide prevention? Um, just going to go back to the last one, if I just can. Sure. Um, um, I had um, depression for about three years, and some of those um, symptoms that I had, I, I share with the question that I had before. And what I found was consistent um, engagement with my psychologist um, and also with the use of medication helped me get off the couch um, and helped me become a lot more engaging. But that was actually symptomatic of the mental illness that I had. Um, I'm not too sure if that's the case here. So, and this person that I saw was um, was was female as well. So I wasn't seeing an Aboriginal male. Um, I wasn't seeing a gay person or a queer person as well. I found that for myself, what worked was on the engagement with the um, with the therapist. Um, for the social emotional well wellbeing, we all, it, hasn't, it hasn't been unpacked in a in a queer context, um, but also I haven't seen it really being robustly investigated as an effective tool for suicide prevention. Um, I'm a bit of an outlier in um, in suicide prevention, particularly in the Indigenous suicide prevention space, but I have a lot of questions, um, and mainly because I'm really really want the, the evidence to be robust and I want I want to be able to the work that we do to prevent people from dying by suicide and at the moment I see that there is a lot of language that gets used in Indigenous suicide prevention that really doesn't have any meat on it and so in terms of the wheel um, I think it's a great tool in terms of in real practical sense in terms of identifying um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folk what's important to them under those domains of well-being um, for them but it's never been um, yeah in, investigated or robust, robust, robustly researched in terms of how um, it applies or how, what needs to happen what are the queer elements of social emotional well-being what's our experiences um, in terms of how the interventions will look thanks Damien I just wanted to say you know I'm constantly looking at the questions and scrolling through them and you know we've had a lot of wonderful questions come in and we're not going to be able to get through them all because we've got about seven minutes or so left for questions so I do apologize if we don't get to your question and and I'm sure there's ways we can you can follow up with us afterwards um, there's a question here that I would like to direct to everyone and maybe everyone wants to have a say. I thought it was a wonderful question, which is about as community members ourselves with lived experience, how do you keep yourself safe and well when working with our peers, other LGBTIQ plus people in suicide prevention? When we all know either, either know people or have experienced that distress ourselves. Um, so I, I think one of the things is is our own community right so so there's community of clinicians there's also supervision um, and being in groups where you are discussing some of the complexities and the challenges of working within your community um, and and some of the challenges are the the I guess knowing exactly the experiences that they have, that people are having that are walking through your door and having have had some of those similar experiences with you, whether it's trauma in medical settings um, or lack of affirmation uh, from other psychologists or, or other doctors um, and, uh, and knowing what that does to you. I think it makes you a better clinician um, be because you're able to know a little bit about what works but also fight for, for making sure that we can get change happening. But definitely supervision and definitely your own support network and groups that you can talk through cases and, and get the support you need.
that's start with exactly the same point, which is a reflective practice. Um, so, and, and having different mechanisms for that. I know in medicine, it's not always very well structured. So if you don't have it, then make it. Um, and I certainly have, have done that. Um, I'd say, as is often the case, put your own oxygen mask on first, attend to your own wellbeing, um, have a good GP, have a good therapist. Um, as Emerson said, find ways to nourish yourself socially and emotionally and physically. For me, it's swimming. Uh, find the things that help you let off steam and, and process what, what you've experienced. Um, and, and know your boundaries, I guess. And, and that extends to not just um, you know, recognising the signs of burnout or the signs, because it can be a burden wearing the different hats and feeling that sense of experience, you know, uh, the, 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 the shared experience. Um, but, but also to recognise that just because you come from this community doesn't mean that you know exactly what that person's going through as well, because it is such a diverse experience. And, um, and try to step back as much as you can and use those clinical tools um, with that extra sprinkle of empathy that you have um, because of that shared experience. Um, that'd be my, my suggestions. Thanks, Zari. Did Damien, did you have something to add? Yeah, look, what I've learned through my experience of um, over a decade working in, in the field um, is that I ne needed to have interests outside of suicidology and, um, and suicide prevention to really have activities that I can engage in. I took up archery um, for something different um, to take my mind. I think I'm also an avid reader. Um, but because for myself within the space that we work, it's not just around the loss of life that is traumatic um, and, and observing and hearing about how the quality of life for some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folks isn't optimal. It's also the constant structural racism that we experience within the queer community and also the structural homophobia within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. So I find myself particularly, you know, as the founder of Black Rainbow, and starting those conversations that I bear the brunt of quite a bit of the res, um, reaction from uh, the non-Indigenous queer community because suddenly I've just called them racist, also the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community because I've just called them homophobic. The bottom line is that's the behaviour when there is those structural barriers in place that actually affects the prevention of suicide by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer folk. So these are really tough conversations to have um, but that's something that has just come with the job now. Um, so for, again, for myself, I switch off. I separate now, even as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer person, working in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer suicide prevention, really do what I can to disconnect from that body of work. Um, but I just wanted to share that as well. So if you are, you have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer colleagues, that's also going on for them as well. Mm, thanks, Damien, that's a great point. Um, so we are almost out of time for questions. We've got a couple of minutes left and we've got quite a few left. So I'm picking the last one um, that again I think is a good opener for everyone to maybe comment on briefly is what should be the minimum criteria for an organisation to be able to say they're truly an LGBTIQA plus affirming supportive service? It's a gold question. <laughs> I think it's about uh, capacity building within the staff, so the skill sets and knowledge of, of the to everyone. That's not just the clinicians; it's also the reception staff, um, especially the, the reception staff actually, who are often the front-facing experience that people have when they engage with the service. Um, and then it's looking at, you know, the physical environment, the the, the information systems, your records, your, your the way that you actually capture information about the people you work with. Um, I think that those would be the very bare minimum standards for me, that they need to have done some accredited training. Um, and they and I think there is a set of minimum standards as some in Victoria here in New South Wales and the resources we've shared that you can use to literally tick yourself off against as an organisation. Emerson, Damien? Uh, my bare minimum is to ensure that the environment that they're walking into uh, is safe for them to engage. Again, the, the services that you're offering um, potentially could be life-saving. And so that person needs to feel comfortable um, within that space. Um, and also to not be fearful of making a mistake. And if you do make a mistake, own that you've made the mistake. And I just want to go back to something about the pronouns. Uh, as a cisgendered gay man, when I see other people using pronouns, I know that they've that I'm going to be safe as a gay man. 
um, or there's going to be a level of safety because they've gone to that, that extra bit of the step. I'm currently working with a large cohort of people at the moment and I'm the only one with pronouns in my Zoom and it's online and we're about to have um, a in-person meetup in a few weeks and I'm like, I don't know what the level of safety is. So those small things, the signs and the symbols, I think are really important and can't be um, under, understated. Um, in terms of um, incredible training, I've not seen anything or come across anything that's um, had a particular Indigenous queer lens put over it to ensure that it is looking at the intersectionality of being both Indigenous and queer. Emerson, any quick one minute comment? Yeah, one, one minute comment would be that, that uh, you know, I'd really encourage everyone to, to do their own gender journey. Just because you're cis doesn't mean that you don't get to break down gender and work out your own gender and so don't feel that this is exclusive for trans people and that would actually make your practice a whole lot better and and make practices a whole lot safer so that might have already been a neat way to wrap things up in a way but i would like to turn it back to our panelists again and ask do you have any last minute things that you'd like to say from your own perspective from your own work in a minute or two that sort of really summarizes your take on the topic this evening Let's start with Atari. <laughs> uh, well, first, I just want to say thanks to everyone who uh, showed up tonight, because I think that's already a great sign that you are self-aware of, you know, wanting to develop your skills in this space, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I also want to extend a thanks to the fellow panellists who were absolutely fantastic. Um, I think in terms of the key things, um, I think be, be a human, I think is the point that Damien's made a number of times tonight. Um, you don't have to get it 100% right, you won't. It's not possible, that's okay. Um, and just commit to learning from those experiences and doing the best you can. Um, pay attention to language, learn the language, and there are lots of resources to help you with that. And then practice those skills over and over. Um, and, and maintain that practice because I guarantee the language will change. It has in my lifetime of, of experience um, and, and keep a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, a forward thinking approach at all times. Thanks, Atari. Amazon? Um, the final comments I'd like to make is, is that the, the burden education should be on the clinicians, not on the people who are presenting to you in crisis, uh, go and get educated and we need you. We, we need more people educated and willing to work in this space and uh, that is what's going to save lives and that's what's going to normalise things within community and allow people just to live and be their authentic self. And for myself, um, I feel really privileged and then that I've had this opportunity to learn from both Atari and Emerson um, over this short little bit this evening, but also in preparation for. And I'm really going to um, wave the gender affirming flag here. I think that it's, it's really is essential, um, not just at a clinician level, but also at a societal level. I think that families um, need to have access to the, this information. I think there's a lot of families out there with young children who require gender affirming care and parents don't know what that is or don't know how to ask for it and young people don't um, know how to ask for it and that that's really upsetting to me so uh, that, that's the flag that I'm going to wave for this evening is around you know you get into this gender affirming care find out what it is and and not just at the clinicians level also around educating um, for families because they, they need it and also the young the young people need it especially I'd be really sneaky and add one more thing because sure, David, sure, sure. David just, just did inspire me to remind myself to say this too, which is to, to not let it end at your one-on-one -on -one work and um, to recognise that working in this space, you have a lot of power um, from the positions that you all occupy and you can do a great deal of work in terms of helping to change structures as we've heard from everyone tonight that the structural issues are, are really significant. So I encourage you to advocate in that, that it extends to thinking about where and how you vote and, and petitions and be, be vocal as you can in supporting um, these communities. Trans people have really borne the brunt of some extraordinarily um, damaging public debate recently without any trans people being able to participate in them, or very few, and um, we really do need allies. Um, so I just want to advocate for advocacy. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Atari. Thanks, Amazon, and thanks, Damien. Uh, so we've had quite a few uh, questions come in that obviously we couldn't address, and many of them were about resources. 
So we do have a wonderful uh, resource that's going to be that is available to you to download that has lots of links and references and resources and, and information about all the uh, reports that Damien's done, for example, and websites. But we, I can already see, and I'm sure MHPN can see as well, that there have been some questions that have come through that maybe we haven't included enough resources around. So certainly we will continue this conversation between ourselves and we will work with MHPN to update that list of resources as needed. Certainly there was a question that came in at the very end around uh, the intersections of suicidality and domestic violence for LGBTIQ plus people. So you know, I can certainly speak, and I'm sure Atari would, would as well too, a wonderful resource from ACON uh, that ha is really fantastic information around um, domestic violence for LGBTIQI plus people. That includes, you know, a, a locate yourself and where's the nearest service for you in it. So we'll add some of these extra resources into our existing resources we already have up there for you. Um, in the coming days to make sure that the extra questions we were asked about around, you know, the inclusion of non-binary young people in schools and the legislative issues that some people may be facing around the inclusion of LGBTIQ people in hospitals and in other medical services, questions around domestic violence. So we want you to know that we've heard those questions. Um, we couldn't get to all of them this evening, but many of them for me were around resource information. So we will make sure those resources are added in to the resources we've already got there for you. So I'd like to wrap up by starting by giving my genuine heartfelt thanks to our three panellists um, for saying such amazing things. And I already knew what they were going to say, but even what they said was amazing to hear again. And extra things they've added in that I didn't know was going to be added in was just amazing. Those extra sort of thoughts and comments that they've shared with us, I think, are really inspiring uh, for why we all do this work. Um, I would like to ask all the attendees to take a moment to do the feedback survey. It's so important for MHMPN to learn about what we do well and what we could do better, both as panelists, but also as an organization. Um, and if you don't have time to do that this evening, don't have time to click on the link, then you'll get follow-up information from MHPN to encourage you to do that survey, which is really, really important. Uh, the next slide, please. So there's just a few bits and pieces of housekeeping um, to remind you around what's coming up. So there's a number of webinars coming up in the coming weeks. There's one on assessment and engagement with infants and children that you're welcome to register for. There is other ones coming up around, um, the, the, the more information will be coming out soon. So we encourage you to keep an eye on that information and to register for things that may be interested to you. And to go back to what all the panelists said, to ensure that this information is going through your network. So we had, you know, 1,500 odd people here this evening, but we want you to get that word out to people beyond all of you and to keep the sort of momentum happening for people to understand the work that MHPN does. So in summary, um, MHPN's networking program supports practitioners to meet a network with others from their local community. There are more than 350 across the country. Visit the MHPN website, mhpn.org.au to find your nearest. If you're interested in starting one, contact um, by email MHPN or, and they'll provide you details. Or you can ask this in, in your feedback survey for more information about how you make that contact. So in conclusion, I'd like to note, um, I'd like to really acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for your participation this evening.